Hey, this is Sarah Vaughn with Harley Davidson. Today we're talking to Jay Shia from Madhouse Motors. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, I'm super excited to be talking to you, actually. I'd have to say inspiring to someone who does like to occasionally tinker on her bike when I have time. So I think it's really great. Uh, you've done some pretty cool builds for a lot of different motorcycle shows that go on throughout the year. I know you did a crazy one that's a uh, hand pull start. Oh yeah, that was a ridiculous, <laughs> ridiculous project. <laughs> Something I should have never done. But uh, yeah, no, I appreciate you checking out my work. Yeah, they sound incredible. Uh, I mean, I know a, a little bit about how you got into it, but can you tell everybody how how you got into motorcycle maintenance and bike builds? And, and also, two-parter, when did you learn to ride and did it kind of coincide with around the time you started learning to work on stuff? Um, when I learned how to ride and when I learned how to, to wrench on them uh, was at two different time periods. I started riding as a kid, um, kind of like a bunch of other kids do on little dirt bikes um, around the yard and you know up at land just riding around on, on little like ATVs and, and dirt bikes. Um, but when I was a young teenager, my father uh, got into a kind of pretty crazy hoarding habit and, um, you know, started collecting a bunch of motorcycles. And it was when my interest in bikes was beginning to, to start, you know, aside from just kind of fooling around on little bikes. I started tinkering on them kind of for no reason not with any kind of goal in mind. And he one day basically told me that if I could fix a bike in the yard, I could, I could have it. And uh, <laughs> the bike I chose uh, hardly needed anything. It was like a battery, like carb clean. Um, <laughs> and so I started riding around as a young teenager. And um, I've, I've kind of said this story a couple times, but I always feel sort of like a jerk admitting it, but I wanted to I wanted to show off so bad. And so as a teenager, I'd ride around and I'd park you know the bike I was riding in public spaces and kind of like sit on it and wait for someone to like compliment me or something. <laughs> and uh, and when people would come up to me, they'd see the bike, they'd say, "Oh, you know, this is an old bike. It was CB 550. I you know I had and I had this like really gorgeous paint job." And when people asked where I got it, I would tell them, "Oh, I, I you know, I work on them." And I didn't know, I didn't know what I was doing at all. And I'd give people uh, the address to my dad's backyard, and people started showing up. And I had no idea what I was doing, and I had to basically um, improv my way through fixing other people's motorcycles. And um, that then grew into me doing tire and oil changes in his yard for most of my teenage years. And then um, I was lucky that there was a mechanic next door who was working on race bikes for the USCRA. And he would watch me and he would correct me all the time and yell over the fence that I was doing something wrong. And he wound up teaching me. That's Sarah Anthony. He now owns Nova Motorcycles. Yeah, and it seems like your dad was really on board with and okay with having all those people over in the yard. Yeah, so my dad is my dad's quite a character, um, and I think he he got a kick out of it. He likes to you know take things apart and tinker himself. Um, he got as much entertainment out of it as I did, and I think he he liked that I was making a buck doing tire changes instead of you know working at a coffee shop or something like that. Yeah. How far back in your family does riding motorcycles go? Over, probably around 100 years now. I have a photo of my grandmother, or let's say like 80 years, I have a photo of my grandmother riding a bike uh, in Syria, which must have been in the 1940s. Wow, that kind of seems like uh, a big thing for that era. Yeah, she was, she was a wild one especially for the time and especially for the part of the world that we're from. That definitely must, all of that's a big influence on you. So anyone running their own business knows it's daunting. You must have a great support system. Uh, I, I absolutely do. Um, my business was kind of built as a collaborative effort between uh, a lot of people that saw where we started. So a lot of the customers who originally were coming 
to get their bikes fixed in my dad's yard, which the shop is named after. So my father's house and his yard is called the Madhouse locally. Um, not only because of the motorcycles, but because it's kind of this really junky, messed up house that always has things falling down and people there. And there's like, you know, a dozen people that live there at a time. And, um, and so my customers who at the time were coming to the Madhouse, uh, which is now, you know, 10 years ago, those are the ones that wound up being sort of the foundation of growing this business to where it is now. Um, some I've hired as, you know, people who basically work full time at the shop and others do stuff on the back end. So the shop was definitely a collaborative effort between a lot of people. I, I know you have, it's, it seems from the, the projects you work on and the, and the, the way you work on them, you have a real love for the creative artistic side of building. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I um, actually never wanted to be a, a professional mechanic or have this be a full-time thing. Um, I, me doing tire and oil changes was basically just to, to survive and pay my rent and things like that. I actually wanted to go to school and I did go to school to be a documentary photographer. My life goal was to be a war photographer which like I still photograph sometimes, but now in the day and age where on the cover of the New York Times can be a cell phone photo, it's kind of made people who, want, who wanted to be documenting war photographers have a much more uh, uh, difficult path to getting there as a lifelong career. So anyways, I went to all four years of school, of art school and during schools when I was you know, also working on motorcycles. But there I learned how to view and critique um, if with an artistic eye as a young adult, which then when I'd go home, I would slowly start to apply that to what I was working on um, and caring more about the lines and the, and the colors and the textures and the shapes and the silhouettes of the machines that I was leaving art class. You know, when I was leaving art class to go look at these machines, I was viewing them a little bit differently. Um, and so I'm really grateful for my time going to college um, and going to art school, which seems like it shouldn't necessarily coincide, but in my case, um, I've found kind of a healthy way of blending them together, which has been really fun. Yeah, I went to school for photography, and I remember back in the day, uh, my photojournalist teacher was let go with the entire staff of the Chicago Sun-Times. And it was a huge shift in, in photography in general and how and who's shooting it and how. So I completely understand where you're coming from on that. So you have some, some stuff you're working on right now. I'm wrapping up on what I think is kind of one of the bigger projects of my career, which is sort of going to be a little bit like a statement to, to who I am as a builder and as a designer. And I'm, I'm hoping that it all works out. But... Uh, like every artist, they sometimes do things that is not well received. So I'm, I'm kind of curious about this one. <laughs> um, for the past couple years, have been building machines that function abnormally um, and that are viewed abnormally and kind of digested by the audience abnormally. Um, and like the bike you had mentioned at the beginning, the BSA Pull Start, um, that bike uh, is the start of a series that I'm doing. And then the the predecessor to that was so again that bike starts with a pull start which is kind of strange and abnormal and has only happened a couple times in, in history once by Velocet Ali in France right and so after doing that bike I was really intrigued at um, kind of breaking the norms and the rules of how machines function and how they operate so the bike after that was a was a 1957 Royal Enfield um, Indian with a foot throttle. So this bike functions um, the same way that you operate a stick shift car. Uh, these are the two bikes that are starting off this series, um, which again, function and operate in ways that uh, traditionally are not, are not done for, for motorcycles. You know, I've never seen a motorcycle with a gas pedal, which intrigued me to make this. The next two that I'm doing, I guess I 
kind of spilled beans on that, but I'm building these, these two uh, Harley Aramaki 350s, which are going to be uh, kind of the, the end cap of this project. And I'm not gonna go too much into it, but my goal is once they're all done to display them all together and have them be an interactive piece where it's not necessarily just about the individual motorcycle, but it's about how each machine interacts with each other and how the viewers get to experience the project in whole instead of it just being a single machine. It's definitely something I, I can't wait to see because my mind is blown a little bit by <laughs> just hearing you talk about it. Yeah, I, I hope it works out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will. You, you got the skills. You utilize so many different interesting parts that you don't ever see on motorcycles, like egg slicers, all sorts of different things. Like what is the, maybe the strangest thing to you that you've ever used on one? I've liked with this style that I'm doing right now, kind of peppering in some, some funny parts because sometimes I think uh, I can come across sort of serious when I'm really kind of a huge nerd and kind of a goof. And so there's been some, some objects that I've used that are there to kind of lighten up the more serious and heavy weighted feeling of the bikes I'm building, like the egg slicer on the Royal Enfield. That bike, for me, comes across like a freight train. It's really heavy, it's really serious, it's really dark. But the egg slicer sort of is like, all right, everyone chill out, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And I'll give a little foresight Speaking of strange objects, these next bikes I'm building, um, they completely revolve around micro, uh, microscope parts. I, th I think that's what really intrigues me about your stuff uh, as a whole, is that it is, it is a piece of artwork. I mean, I know, I know bike builds in general are, and they come from a, a great creative place in all builders, but I, I do like the added element of your research and your fun with it and your process. It's very creative and, and artistic. So it seems, especially right now, that companies and brands and people in general are stepping up and joining the bigger conversation. Is that something that you have felt on a personal level? With everything going on in this, in this current climate, um, I feel like it's been, it's been pretty amazing to see all the momentum that individuals as well as bigger companies are taking towards change. And yes, there's some companies that historically haven't, um, haven't been there, but the fact that they're now putting in so much effort is really admirable. Um, and even if, you know, even if it seems like it might be, some people can criticize saying, oh, it's a little, it's a little late. There's no such thing as a little late for change. Um, and so with the Black Lives Matter movement, with uh, the LGBTQ um, community, uh, all of the, the help from anyone, if it's about putting stuff out uh, on media, if it's about monetary donations, if it's about conversations with people um, in the motorcycle community, face to face or with customers or with clients or whoever it may be, each little step is a step in a, what's hopefully the right direction. It's funny because motorcycles in my entire life I've viewed just as, as a machine to work on and to do the tire change, to do the oil change, and I was actually for majority of my life pretty unaware of the massive culture and community um, outside of it. And now that I'm older and I'm seeing how the motorcycle as a machine is actually just a bridge for individuals and groups to meet each other to have camaraderie. It's, it's amazing to see who those groups are and how they come together. And so the motorcycle itself, you know, Harley riders, if it's a group of gay women or trans guys or farmers from Idaho who go and ride together and use the machine as that tool, it's just a unifying factor. It's not really about the motorcycle, it's about people wanting social connection. For what's going on now, it's, it's really nice that companies like, like yourself, like Harley, like what NASCAR did, are, are stepping up and saying, hey, use this motorcycle as a positive tool to have community, to have uh, camaraderie, to bring people together instead of divide. 
It's hard to give a suggestion to anyone where it really comes down to their moral compass, right? But that moral compass can be can be kind of swayed and persuaded and, and, and readjusted with education. It's really easy to turn an eye and ignore uh, people that you don't want to have to put in the mental effort and mental strain to understand. A lot of people just, they want their clientele, they want to keep it simple and straight, they don't want to feel that awkward insecurity about how to interact or pronouns or whatever. But if you're going to be mentally lazy about really being progressive, then that's, then that's the shame. And so businesses and companies out there that are not putting in the effort to educate themselves, it's a form of laziness and it's a form of neglect, you know. So like for myself, who I am as an individual, right? I am a, a gay Arab American female business owner with a young black non-biological son in inner city Boston. <laughs> but my, my point is, is that at the end of the day, I'm, it's just, it's a motorcycle shop. The labels and the stereotypes and all that shouldn't be always on the forefront of social interaction. You know, it, it's, it's what, you know, what are you here for? Oh, a tire change. What do you want? Uh, Pirellis or Dunlops? You know, it shouldn't be, you know, hey, you know, wh where are you from? What's, you know, what's your job? Oh, okay. Can you, are you going to be paying with card or cash? Because you're feeling insecure about who you're interacting with. A lot of people overcomplicate their lives by judging so hard. Um, and so motorcycle shops are, are pretty far behind on being an inclusive space. And uh, that can change by just everyone just chilling, chilling out a little bit. Their, their customers, their clients just do the work and leave them alone or be friendly and make them feel included. And seeing that unfold is really important. I mean, it seems like, it seems like historically, motorcyclists as a group have been betrayed in a certain way as well. Um, as part of the larger picture, what would you like to see as a takeaway for people or more discussions around in the future regarding breaking down barriers and stereotypes as an intersectional issue? So. Yes, motorcycles have been um, predominantly used in, in the U.S., okay, because it is different in other countries, but in the U.S., motorcycles have been predominantly used and utilized by, by white men, which is, which is just, that's just history. Um, and that's, that's kind of for almost the full spectrum of motorcycles, not just Harley, not just Indian, not just, you know, Japanese bikes or British bikes in the, you know, 60s here. So it's, it's the full spectrum of, of machines. Now, it's, it's been pretty amazing to see how people are going out of the way, even though history is not necessarily on their side, going out of the way and riding bikes in a way of almost rebelling against the history. So you'll see a group of, you know, you know, 50 people who represent the LGBTQ community riding Harleys. And it's almost uplifting saying, you know what? Historically, this wasn't something that could happen. You know, mind you, or women riding. And now they're, they're taking that and almost flipping it. And the support from big companies has been pretty amazing. Like you guys right now reaching out to do a podcast as representatives of this company. You know, these steps are exactly what is needed to kind of reverse the historic oppression that groups have, have felt. And so you're seeing, you know, women motorcycle builders, women representatives of these, you know, big name motorcycle companies, gay designers and, you know, and LGBTQ racers, and it's now diversifying on this global scale. And if people aren't pushing it down, then it's slowly but surely making steps towards a more equal uh, motorcycle community.